YouTube. Today we have a really special guest, and I'm going to tell a little bit story about the guest. But before I do that, let me welcome my pal and artisan residence Art Wolf. Art, welcome, and how are you doing? I'm so excited to hear Tom. I haven't seen Tom for about a year and a half, so it's exciting. Great. I'm doing well, by the way. You're doing well, by the way. Thank you for answering the question. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so like I said, it's really, really special today for me. I got to say, uh, the two people on this frame, let me tell a bit about Tom Mengelson uh, before we welcome him officially. It's a real story. And it is actually the reason in many ways, along with Art Wolf, why I'm doing Earth as a Witness. And here's a story. Um, here's a beautiful book. Beautiful, beautiful book. It's called The Natural Wonder. And here's what it says. To Parimal, may these places inspire you in your photography and filmmaking. May our paths cross again. Best wishes, always, Tom Mickelson, 2008, July 24. That's what it says. And the reason I say that is because in 2008, uh, around that time, just three months before I actually met Tom, I met Art. And these two people changed my life. I have to say, be honest, changed my life. And the reason for that is since 2008, I had this huge craving, a passion to do something in photography, either as a professional myself or as a creator of some kind to contribute in my own way to the world of photography. And I met Art at that time, about three months before I met Tom, I went to a gallery that Tom had in Kirkland in Seattle, Washington. And I would go there literally every Friday to see his beautiful panoramic images. In fact, I purchased one called Changing Lanes. And then I got the word that Tom is actually going to visit the gallery. And I said, oh my God, I got to meet this guy. And I met, I stood in line, I bought the book and I said, Tom, can you please autograph? And he said, what's your name? I you know, gave him my name and I said, like, what are you about? And I said, I want to do something in photography, maybe filmmaking, I don't know exactly what, but it'll be something interesting and hopefully useful in photography. That's when he wrote. And uh, I got to say like, thanks to that inspiration, and also then I met Art many times, became friends. Thanks Art to your inspiration. Today we are doing Earth as a Witness. And lo and behold, uh, Tom, you said, may our paths cross again. So after 13 years, our paths are crossing again. So I want to, with that story, really give you a very, very heartfelt uh, welcome to Earth as a Witness. Thank you. All right, me. well Thank stated, Parabal. Yeah. Can Thank we do a little you. cheers? Thank you. I'm honored to be here with my old friend, Art. Here's to oh, you, buddy. I know you love okay. tequila, and I uh, I even got a glass that looked like yours when I saw your tequila presentation, so cheers to you guys. Uh, yeah, we, we can't clink, but uh, there you go, Tom. And I think we've drank uh, plenty of tequila in our travels together. We have drank plenty of our, plenty, plenty. Oh, well, in fact, if uh, just briefly, and I'll let you get on is when uh, we were down in Merida uh, on, on the Yucatan, we had Jane Goodall at our table. And I do remember we were drinking tequila. I bought her a tequila and it was the first tequila I think Jane ever drank. But she was not resistant and she drank it all down in one fell swoop. She is a Scotch whiskey drinker and that is her, that is her flavor. But- She's like me. Yeah. There I like. I, like I had that last night with my neighbor, actually. I love Lefroy. I love Lefroy. If if she's like you, should we start calling you Jane? I don't know. I hope I have an illustrious future like her. Even if it's one person, right. I'm happy. Okay. Anyway, so back to our topic. Today's topic is a life in the wild. And uh, when Tom and I and Art we spoke, we said let's do something interesting and special. What's close to your heart? And he said let's do a life in the wild because it's not just any images he's gonna to share today in the stories, it's really his special images when he looks back at his very distinguished career. Uh, it's those really special images that today stand the test of time and actually is a rallying cry for us people to save the really iconic species. And that's the topic today is from his legacy reserve collection, which is a premium collection. And we're again honored Tom, not just to have you, but also to have you speak to a very special topic, a life in the wild that's close to your heart. Thank you, Paramount. Um, yeah, I'll explain the, how this came about. Um, so about, I guess over my 50 years, I guess now, 
of photography. I came late. Uh, I know art came early to art, uh, traditional art in photography when you were a kid. I didn't buy a camera until I was out of undergraduate school. But um, anyway, since then, I've made something like 3,000 limited edition prints, I think. And of course, 2,500 I probably shouldn't have made, but maybe maybe a few more than that. But, but uh, I always started numbering them at um, number 26 of 500 or 350 or 250 or 1,000, whatever it might be. And my rationale at the time was because I wanted to keep the first 25 numbers for my family or friends or special occasions or maybe down the road for conservation efforts or I just wanted to save them for because I wanted to, I guess, maybe someday I would do something with them. So about five years ago, I realized that at my age that maybe I should do something with those 25 images, i.e. at least print them and sign them and number them in case I croak, you know, might be a good idea. My, my uh, heirs, uh, nephews and nieces and brothers might appreciate that I actually did something with friends, those. Friends. Yeah. So, so I thought, well, what would be, what would be the 20 or so prints that I should, or my, my favorites, you know, not, not what sold best or what, you know, Cardinal, you know, bird on the stick or something, but what I really liked and what I thought was uh, something like what art does, you know, really, truly art. And, and I could talk about art for quite a while. I know you would like that art, but I won't do that right now. But I will go there a little bit later. So <laughs> you have been a big inspiration. Oh, thank and you. I will digress for one second because I did. I remember going to Alaska uh, on a trip and seeing uh, all these owl pictures down the stairway in um, REI. Uh, I was getting some rain gear or something, and they were all pictures of owls. And I thought, I wonder who the hell this young whippersnapper is. They're taking all these beautiful owl pictures and they're in REI and he's making prints of them. And, and I said, well, he's good. He said, this guy's really good. And that was like, you know, 10 years later, I think we met. I mean, we obviously followed each other's work. So yeah. back to the limited edition legacy thing. But uh, so about the same time, David Wagner, who is a tour operator of, of art shows for museums and a uh, curator of art. He wrote sort of the book on wildlife art, traditional art. He asked me if I would be willing or interested in having a traveling photography show with my work. And so the, the two things came together that I wanted to do something with my top 50 or 40 or 30, where we might decide. And we decided on doing the top 40 sort of classics, which was a bit of a difficult decision on for many reasons but you know how editing goes so we selected 40 images for and he wanted everything to be in a basically a 30 by 45 30 by 40 format so large image which would make in his estimation for his experience at for museum shows about the right size for having you know 40 would be a, a, a bigger show in a you know good museums so that's how it came about and uh, then he started advertising. He hadn't done, I don't think, any photography shows before. Most of them were traditional art. And um, and he had represented a lot of people like Robert Bateman and Owen Grammy, who was my mentor, and and uh, I think Bob Kuhn and some other really wonderful traditional artists that I was uh, really respected. And so I, I said, yeah, sure, of course, that'd be great. So he set up, he started advertising. And so there's a traveling museum show now that's gone to oh eight or ten music shows another there was another 10 online and hopefully it'll go for another few years and maybe in europe but it started off in at the national wildlife art museum here uh and also in omaha my hometown so to speak um and durham museum there so that's how the collection started and thank you for david wagner for recognizing that this would be worthwhile doing and it's been i think fairly successful and it's at the robert bateman museum in victoria uh, british columbia now so and that's a huge honor and, and robert been one of my idols for 
from the beginning. And just to have my work connected to his is a true honor. Have so, you met oh yes, we go back um, 25 years, maybe he's been at my cabin in Nebraska with Jane actually. And, and he's been here uh, in Jackson several times and he's an incredible human being and an incredible artist as is his, his wife is a incredible photographer. Very good. And, just wonderful, wonderful people. You know them, I'm sure you're very close. We've led uh, rock trips together down Wild Rivers, but get back to your story. No, so anyway, that's uh, that's pretty much the the collection. And, and with that, um, we've had a, um, Jane Gola asked, speaking of her, she, uh, I'm always trying to promote her, her, um, goals and for JGI, Jane Goodall Institute and Roots and Shoots programs for children and which are all over the world. She's many, many chapters uh, in every country. And so I asked her if she would be interested in, in uh, helping be part of this thing. So we just had anybody who bought one of the first, so we numbered one through 20 of the number one through 20 of those images I'd never printed. And if someone bought one of those images, they would have an evening with Jane at my house, uh, formal dining out in the out in the yard by the creek and by the pond, and and then a uh, um, chat around the fire with Jane and cocktails, etc. And it's been a really fun and incredible experience. And then a lot of the proceeds would go back to Jane's good good uh, conservation efforts. Unfortunately, she hasn't been able to do it this last year because of COVID and the last in the, in the year before. So uh, we have to wait till next year to make up for that. But it's been a really great, um, I think, effort. And, and I feel good about you know where the money's going to. And of course, um, that's what it's all about for us photographers trying to make things happen outside of our own lives. But yeah. so what I'm going to show tonight are I think 16 or so of those images um, of the 40. And um, I'll tell a little story about how they came about. And um, then Art, you can, in Paramount, you can critique it well. <laughs> and uh, we'll go from there. Don't Sorry. tell us, I mean, tell the story, but on a couple of them, quiz us as to where they were shot. Okay. I love okay. a, a, a challenge. Okay, well, I'll, maybe I'll do that with the first one. How's this? Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're looking very young, by the way. Oh, and you are too. Thank you so much. We, That's a, the more we drink, the younger we look. Okay. Well, that, okay. Come no, on. no, no, this is not fair. This is no, 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 not that one. Go, go back. Oh, no, no. We're the first one. Go back. No. The first no, one. No, the first one is the first. That's not the first. This this is my, first my lovely assistant. Don't screw, uh, Paramal, don't screw up, Tom. That's a beautiful but, shot. No. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. We're not. Just scroll up. Yeah, just scroll up. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. We got a nail art here. He, he volunteered for this. There you go. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, would, I would say this. Uh, it's one of my favorite shots of yours, by the way. I love the white background, and this is a female and male uh, kestrel. And I would say this is either photographed in Jackson or Yellowstone. Bingo, Yellowstone. Wow. Wow! Did you know this? Did you guys did, talk before? Do you, you, you see the thermals in the background or something, or what? Well, look at the white background. I mean, it has to be Yellowstone. Well, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. No, I actually know. I know your work, anyways, and I knew it was in Yellowstone. I threw out Jackson you... just to make it seem like I didn't know everything. Okay, I'm going to give you a more <laughs> difficult one later. So yes, this was in the Lamar Valley in Yellowstone, and uh, it's. Uh, so probably inspired by you, Art, down the, you know, in some ways. Uh, but it was taken, I realized today, because it's my brother David's birthday, who's been my best supporter ever. It was wow. taken in 1984 on May 4th today. 
which is 37 years ago. I don't think you were born yet, Art, were you? Were you no, 30? I mean, uh, I was almost about to be born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Paramount were... just shut up. Yeah, so, <laughs> so is it, like you said, female on the top, male on the bottom, and it's, a, it's in a little grove of uh, old aspen trees um, in Lamar Valley, and it was snowing out just like it was today there. And um, the male kestrel, uh, I saw them flying into this branch. I knew this little, little woodland, and there's a lot of flicker holes where these, these uh, kestrels have nested for years. Different, not necessarily these, but different ones. And uh, it's a beautiful little place, all kinds of flickers and bluebirds and swallows, and these kestrels nest there. So I, I saw them flying around, and they're looking for nest sites this time of year and the a red-tailed hawk flew over and the male kestrel flew up and chased off the red tail which is about 10 times as larger than he is and uh very aggressive little guys and then he went down and he caught a uh, a little mouse on the top of it. it's about three foot of snow still there and on top of the the uh, little spruce tree was a mouse which i didn't see but he saw it obviously he grabbed the mouse and he came back and fed fed his wife, girlfriend, partner, mate, and she sat there and she ate it. And then he went off and chased another kestrel and knocked it to the ground. Another male, it was in his territory, and the the other male had his wings splayed out, and this male mantled on top of the the other male like it was a you know a rabbit or something. Men will catch rabbits, but it's like a hawk what might do. And, and I was shooting away, shooting away. And I thought, this is incredible against the white snow and, and background. And two male kestrels are so beautiful and colorful. My favorite small bird of prey. And then he went and he mated with her. And uh, then he yawned. Well, he's just yawning here, I think. It was a fairly big morning for him. I went back to the car and I had, most of these images are film. Do you remember film art? You, yeah, you, I you do. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so I went back in the car and I realized that I had double exposed two rolls of film in my panic to get this image of the two birds on the snow and, and mantling and everything. And I realized I had double exposed. And I thought, oh my God. But I had shot like four rolls. We're talking about 36 frames. Now I shot, my assistant told me today that I shot 9,000 frames on bears yesterday, 9,000 frames. Wow. So, so that's with a uh, camera that shoots 30 frames a second. And so those days it was one frame a second or one frame every two seconds. But anyway, I got back and I, I just panicked because I thought this was a really great scene and I love the back background is actually a, a snow flurries. Um, and just, you know, you can see the snow on the branches there. And, and it, this is probably influenced by Robert Bateman more than any, but you, you know, you don't, you're not influenced by something like this, but you pick out these kinds of images and frame them or compose them because of what I see from other artwork, other people, other photography. And, um, of course, you're you're the you're the master at that, Martin. I'm not trying to blow smoke, but uh, design-wise, uh, there's nobody better than what you do. So, but this is more art. This is more like a Robert Bateman, and and uh, because of the negative space and the design and the splash of color and stuff. So I'm I'm, I'm proud of that. This one is my still remains my favorite bird picture I've ever taken. Um, you know, 34, 37 years later, whatever it is. So that's, that's the story, but you, you know, I'm glad you knew where it was because you, you cheated because you already knew that. Well, and the, the fact that it's white, you know, for yeah. the longest time when I was teaching workshops, I would say never have a white background, have a dark background. So the animal comes out. And in fact, your shot of a leopard on a tree and this shot of these two birds, it, uh, says, volumes for the fact it looks like an illustration looks like a painting and it really uh, a, a beautiful white backdrop now i understand why it works so well and it would make a beautiful print thank you i think i'll send you one 
Do but it. maybe you okay it's a deal well you know here's the deal i paid attention you have used the first 20 and then you started your numbering at 26 that means there's five five images floating out there yeah you're right you you're you should be an accountant instead of a photographer i'm on <laughs> it i'm on this okay <laughs> yeah. anyway Okay, we'll go to the next one. Just, just wait till he has a bit more tequila and the numbers will start going south. Okay, that's <laughs> a deal. Okay, now I'm, maybe this is even... Uh, okay, now where's this one from, Mark? Southeast Alaska, probably Frederick Sound. And if I'm wrong, just say I'm right. <laughs> you're, you're so wrong. Okay, is no. Here is, it's above the Yellowstone River. Okay, go oh. ahead. Come on. I'm wasting is your time. This is McDonald Creek in Glacier Park in Montana. And oh. uh, back in the day before I could afford to go to Alaska where the only place that eagles remained because they were all pretty much extirpated from the lower 48 except the ones that were migrating like this one was from Alaska and Canada into the lower 48. You had to go to Alaska to photograph eagles but I didn't have the money nor whatever um, way to get there. So I would go to um, other places like Montana along the coast of, of uh, British Columbia and, and Washington where there were still some eagles. But this one is McDonald Creek and what was going on, there was a, about 1925, the Game and Fish Department in Montana decided to introduce kokanee salmon into the Flathead Reservoir. Um, to supplement fishing opportunities for their fishermen. And the kokanee salmon, usually your saltwater, they will migrate like other salmon to spawning areas, but they don't usually would not spawn in creeks like McDonald Creek. But over the years from 1926 on, they, there was a few of them had this genetic um, reason to go up the creeks and they started spawning in the creek and pretty soon there was you know, some six million salmon running up McDonald Creek and spawning and, and along came, you know, 50 years, 60 years later, eagles discovered this, this salmon run. And there would be 500, 600 eagles in the mid late eighties, uh, learning to go there and stopping over on their way south for this feast of kokanee salmon. And they're very small salmon in a way, they're one pound and 12 inches long or whatever. And this is one eagle, I'd go there every winter, it would be a November, December uh, spawn and the eagles would be there until January. But this is right in really late December and um, bitter cold in a really crappy place to photograph because there's two canyons and the sun was set and in, you know, obviously in the West and, but the Southern skies were always, in, I mean, the river was always in shadow so the light was really difficult. It was always backlit and the morning light was never there. So this eagle, because um, I, I talked to, I, I saw this eagle fishing upstream. All the eagles were downstream, it was like 20 or 30 would sit on this lone spruce tree and go down and catch, catch a salmon in this big pool below the bridge, McDonald Creek Bridge. It's called the Apgar Bridge. And um, this eagle I realized I saw would fly upstream and perch and then go and catch salmon upstream and behind the the that area where there's this this sort of some cottages and things and it was kind of messy with trees and whatever and so not, nobody ever thought of I guess photographing this mess behind but I realized the light would be front lit in the evenings and this eagle would go would catch a fish and I asked the biologist, the fish biologist, which was there every year, kept, you know, studying the fish and the eagles. And he said, this is a female. She comes every year. And female, she, you can tell because it's much larger than the males. And he knew this female because it only had one talon. And so he told me about it. And she fishes upstream because the competition was too tough downstream with all the other eagles. They would catch a fish before she could. And so she started hunting, fishing upstream. So... I just went across the bridge and some days there'd be 15, 20 photographers, bird watchers on the opposite side of the bridge. And I'd go on the other side and I'd just be pretending like I didn't know what the hell was going on. And I would just wait for this eagle to, every two hours to come 
after I digested his fish. And she would come down and she would, with her one talon, grab a salmon and, and with her head, she would tilt her head down and would drag in the water. And she would to, to get in, and she, with her beak, would place it more football carrying like, more aerodynamic in her talon. And in doing so, she would drag her, her head in the water, which froze immediately because it was like 20 below zero. So she has this warrior like look. So that was pretty interesting. And but I exposed again this film. I knew that I had to get the exposure for the white feathers and white tail and head right. So I exposed for that. Again, this is with Fuji 50 or 100, probably 100. And there's not much you know, leeway like we have today, but manual focus, 600 millimeter. And what happened was there was so much difference between the exposure of the head and the tail and the you know, highlights and the wings that all that shit in the background, excuse my language, all the crap in the background went black. So all the you know, cottages and cappers and trees went black and it was not, there's nothing, you know, just happened. And I didn't even realize it at the time. All I knew is I had to get the exposure in the head white, right. And so, uh, you're, you, that's it. And you nailed it. It's and called I out of, out of you, you got it. And it is the antithesis of the previous image with a black background. I, I have been on that bridge during that period of time. And I remember meeting Tom Ulrich. Do you know that name? Course, he had, yeah. yeah, he had glasses as, uh, as thick as uh, uh, Coke bottle bottoms. But I remember being there at that mm -hmm. time of the year. And maybe you were on the same bridge. We just hadn't met prior to that. Well, that's unfortunate. I have to say that's really unfortunate. But anyway, we've met. So that's, that's the fortunate part. Okay, I'll go to the next one. Now you know where this is. You've been there. Yeah. Yep, many times, hundreds of thousands, and it's like people have been there. And it's Brooks Falls, got my national park in Alaska. And I, uh, at the time, it's 1988, in early July, and I uh, was on a trip. For, I was working on a film on sandhill cranes and following them from their from their wintering areas in West Texas through the Platte River where I grew up all the way to Alaska. And one of their stopovers to get across the Bering Sea is in Prince William Sound. And so I went there south of Cordova and there's a huge um, shorebird migration there. I'm sure you've seen that too, Art. And yeah. in photographed it, you photographed everything. So, uh, <laughs> I know you, the shorebirds are amazing there. Millions of shorebirds are, are doing the same thing, migrating. But some cranes stop over and rest before they make the long migration across the Bering Sea to Alaska and, and into Siberia. So I, I did the cranes, I did the shorebirds for this film, uh, which ended up being a, a PBS nature film in the end. But I had about a week between shoots and I went in, I was on the airplane, Alaska Airlines, and I, I was reading this Alaska, you know, one of the airline magazines and flipping through it, I saw this story about Brooks Falls. Well, I had seen thousands of pictures from Brooks Falls. I've seen dozens of films for Brooks Falls. I was working for a film company in Boulder, Colorado at the time. And uh, we had talked about maybe doing a film about bears. So we researched bear films and we saw uh, everything has been done. Now, this is in 88, so you can imagine, you know, obviously they hadn't. But I was looking through and I saw these wide angle pictures of, of the falls and the pool, pools and the river and the bears gathering. There'd be 20 bears or 10 bears and their cubs. And, and, and I thought, I wonder if you could, I saw a, this sort of situation with fish leaping and the bears standing there. And I thought, I wonder if you could just photograph a head and shoulders of a bear with a fish kind of in its face. Not ever seen one before. Although there may have been, but I don't, no one's ever told me there was. I don't think there has been actually, but it's a different. Was, I wanted to do something different, and that's what we all have to do. Um, so I I landed in Anchorage, and I went to a payphone, and I called uh, Brooks River uh, 
park and the guy told me on the phone, I said, you know, I'd like to come on, just see the bears. Even, but the, in the background, this is a picture or, you know, something like this. I was hoping for something like this, but the ranger said, well, do you have a camp site or do you have a, do you have a little fishing lodge or do you have a, I said, no, do you have a you know, reservation? I said, no, he said, well, uh, there's the campsite, you know, early July people come there to fish and, and photograph and you have to have a, you have to have a reservation. And I said, no, I don't. And I, he said, well, there's nothing left, unfortunately. And I said, oh, really? You know? And so he could hear me kind of whining on the phone and he said, well, there is one site, uh, right along Knack Knack Lake, which is a campground that is, is nobody wants because it's right next to the bear trail. And it's really close, but it's a legal campsite, and but nobody wants it. And I said, well, I'll take it. So I went to Kmart, and I bought some food, dry, freeze-dried food in a little tent and, and uh, some you know, camping gear. And I went there, and then I walked to the falls, which, as you know, is like, I don't know, half a mile or so. And they have a little, at that time, they had a little platform, which was, you know, 10 feet long and three feet wide and, and um, you know, six feet off the ground. And the bears, it was right at the falls. So I spent a week there just photographing uh, two or three of these big bears. This one was nicknamed Panda because of its, its black eye. eye. Um, it looked like a panda bear. And most days it rained. A few days, you know, were like this. And then, but the chemistry in the water, the fish weren't migrating and weren't spawning. So I was there from, you know, basically dawn till dusk uh, photographing. I shot 35 rolls of film, which in those days uh, was a phenomenal amount of film. And when I came home, you know, I saw this was, you know, I was close. I would, I realized I had to use a remote because when I was looking through the eyepiece, I realized I could not look through the eyepiece and see the fish coming. Um, it was too late by the time I clicked the shutter. It was, you know, one frame a second. So I used the remote and, um, it's become my, um, obviously my iconic image and probably my most tried to copy the image in a way. And I sold, a, I did posters of, of this, lithographs. It was a limited edition print that sold out. It was 950, it sold out early on. And I made lithographs and there was, a, they sold them to the lodge up there. And they, somebody told me that there was a guy that, um, a photographer told me that the guy hung this poster in the tree next to, in the platform, he had, you know, ah. he punched it into the branches of the tree to figure out where my tripod holes were. <laughs> oh. So, which is a very flattering uh, <laughs> thought, but we all have done that, I suppose, with Ansel Adams and the Snake River over like here where I live or something, but I try not to do that. But anyway, it was a compliment, I guess. But it's, uh, the problem with this image has been very controversial because everybody thinks, oh, it's obviously it's, it's a, it's a BS image. It's, you know, Photoshop. And, you know, I could do that. Somebody t once said that um, you could do it in two days. I just get the bear and the fish and put it in there today. You could do that. But, but um, in those days in 88, there was no Photoshop and, and you couldn't do it. But in, in my, as you know, me art, um, Paramol, it's, it's like, where's the magic if I just did that in the, in Photoshop and, you know, it wouldn't be, you know, the moments like this are rare in our lifetime and those are memorable and that's what keeps me going. And I have no interest in, I, I wouldn't even know how to, I don't know how to Photoshop anything. So I can, couldn't do it and have really no interest, but that's, the, it's, it's become my most it's famous. Pretty. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And you know, you can tell it's film because the shallow depth of field, you had to get it right. You don't have a lot of slop right there. You know, no. if it was a few, uh, you know, six inches beyond, it'd be out of focus. So you can see the plane of focus is very shallow, which belies the fact it was filmed and you got it right. And it's just beautiful. I have photographed that bear a number of years and it is distinctive with that dark ring around its eyes. Yeah. Well, it was a thousandth of a second at five, six and on Fuji 50 or hundred, I'm not, can't remember, but the depth of field is about a foot, maybe yeah. less. You're absolutely yeah. right. Beautiful image. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I want to even ask you if you know where this one is from. Uh, <laughs> is it from uh, Hudson Bay, West Hudson Bay, near Churchill, Manitoba, from a tundra buggy? 
and uh, it's called Bad Boys of the Arctic. And um, I needed, a f I was working my first book in 1987 called Images of Nature. And I, I was doing it on different ecosystems in the, you know, in North America, mostly. And um, I didn't have any, no, I'd never seen a polar bear. I'd seen tracks of polar bears in, at Point Barrow when I was photographing eider ducks years before that. But I realized that I can't do a chapter on the Arctic uh, without having the, you know, the king of the ice, the polar bears, in the book. So I made some arrangements and went up there. And this was actually taken about five or six years after I first started there. But I got... Um, I got hooked on polar bears. I thought I'd just take a few images to plug into my book and, you know, make it uh, you know, a full range of um, complimentary animals, snowy owls and, and uh, everything else. So uh, the, this is a, actually a, a family. Uh, these are three-year-old, two three-year-old males and a female. The female is in the background there. And they were just walking along the shores of Hudson Bay and all of a sudden they just, they just, this one just sat down and it's played out like this. And uh, uh, we call it bad boys because it makes, you know, we all, you know, a lot of people, we try to name this, you know, it took forever. To, sometimes titles are harder than taking a damn picture. But, uh, and people say, well, if you cl look closely between his legs, it looks like he's peeing. But actually, those are penal hairs that are very long, and it's some one of the ways you can tell when a bear's walking. And um, the penal hairs are, you know, just what they are. And uh, so he's not peeing. It's just that. So he's a male. I knew the other one was a male. So this is a mom with older three and a half year old bears, which are kept. She kept them longer than usually be two and a half or three years old. But it. Uh, People love it, and you know they, you know they named it. Uh, where's the ro remote? Where's my beer? You know, they just uh, had too much tequila, is what I can say. Where's my tequila? Speaking of that, here. <laughs> no, you know the, the body posture of that one with the feet out, the belly protruding, the way the hand is holding up its body. I mean, it's just perfect. We've all <laughs> been in that position before. And yeah. uh, so we all empathize with that. It's such a, a anthropomorphic, you know, body posture that it's why obviously it's been popular over the years. Yeah. Michio Hoshino was with me. You know, we, you probably knew Michio is a, yeah. a dear friend and an incredible photographer. And um, he was standing next to me and he hadn't been to Churchill, uh, uh, I don't think before that, but maybe it doesn't matter, but we were shooting it together and he shot it with a 500 and I shot it with a 600, I think. And we both, he was only six feet away. And the funny thing about this, there's some people who have, who have written me and called me because he published the picture too. And they said, this Japanese guy, Michio has stolen your image. <laughs> and I said, no, we were friends and we were together. That's what happens when you're friends and you're together. And sometimes you get the same image, but it's big fun and unfortunately we've lost uh, Micho, but um, we have fun memories. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is after about probably 80,000 frames of photographing polar bears in nine years or something later. And I never felt that I actually um, captured the essence of a polar bear in its element and this is towards the end of November. The bay was freezing, was frozen in most places. And this is right before uh, um, total freeze up. And this ice now, as we know, is literally melting under their feet because of global warming. And it's a very um, serious situation for bears and for the earth. But anyway, this the snow is blowing 30 below zero probably wind chill, who knows, 70 or 80. We are in the tundra buggy, but uh, I had a panoramic 617 Fuji camera. And when I saw this bear out on the ice, it was one of the last bears to leave. They go out on the ice to hunt seals. They have to have ice, uh, a platform because the seals come out 
on top of the ice to rest and to give birth. And, and uh, that's when the polar bears can catch them. They can't catch them in water. They can't swim fast enough to catch a seal. So that's the problem with having no ice, which is happening and especially, you know, in the, those areas that are further south and it will go further north as we, if we continue to let climate change happen. But here's a bear kind of looking off in the distance this little buddy, the Arctic fox, which attached themselves to a particular bear, yeah, I suppose, hoping that the bear will provide them uh, a life living throughout the winter. So these guys are partners, I mean, in a sense, the, the, the fox gets the what's left over from the bear's seal kills. He provides only company, I suppose, for the for the polar bear, otherwise it's not exactly symbiotic, but maybe a friendship. And you mentioned anthropomorphism art. And I think it's a, when I went to graduate school, University of Nebraska, my professor who is now 85 years old, even, and he just did his uh, 90th, but he, we, we had, I had took animal behavior from him. And he told me that, well, we, te- we were taught anthropomorphism giving human characteristics of animals was, you know, a really no-no. And that's been debunked by especially people like Jane Goodall because they do have, you know, the same feelings and sentience and intelligence and they feel pain and they feel joy and they feel, you know, I have to just look at your dog. That's what Jane said. I learned everything I have to, I've ever learned from my dog, Rusty, uh, about intelligence and fun and joy and fear and, and all the stuff that animals have. So I think anthropomorphism to me is, is out the door and we should get over that term because it's not a bad term and we can. Not a bad term. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it was the first panoramic image and our friend Franz Lanting was judging the BBC wildlife photography of the year contest that year. And it won the wildlife photography of the year, uh, competition and he told me later he didn't know this was my image but he's he rooted for it and he said this is you know he thought it was the best image in the group of the judges and stuff but he said they were having a really difficult time agreeing with that because it was panoramic and it wouldn't fit in their their book format which is is a you know more uh, square vertical and he said basically bullshit you know this is the best image and get over it and make it a double page spread or something so it was the first panoramic image that that uh, uh, made made the competition, and so I I, I remained lo- in, in love with Franz. So, <laughs> thank you, Franz. <laughs> so beautiful story. I love this but story. But it it said everything about to me. I mean, the, you know, the green ice and the sunset and the wind, and so um, it um, took me a long time. And the film actually, it was on. Uh, 220 film and half the images were fractured um, because, because I because of the cold because of the cold they're frozen and they were fractured and I was devastated and I was going to throw out all the images that beyond this one this one had very fractures at the very bottom but I just cropped that out but I'm glad he didn't throw out the other images because in film days you you know you can do anything with them. today you could just you know patch them together and you know be fine yeah. but so don't throw away images that might work someday. Just a quick uh, time check. We may want to speed up a little bit. Okay. Uh, okay. So Sorry. I can say that, but again, beautiful images. Thank you. So this is your country, animal, paramount. And, yes. Uh, yes. Beautiful. Images. I love this. From from Bandavgar. From Bandavgar. Yes. And the most famous tigress is her mother Sita, and her father was Charger, who charged everything, including people, elephants, and other tigers. And I was photographing on uh, back of elephants and jeeps. And have you been to Band of Guard um, art? Oh, um, about 20 times. Oh my God, you would always. <laughs> so you know what it's like, it's a beautiful place. Yeah. Yeah. And- Can I uh, tell you a little story I told Tom before we went live to the audience about art and I in Band of Guard is uh, I had gone there with a few of my friends. In fact, one of them, Mayu is watching. And we did two or three days and we roamed around and we just couldn't see Bamera. That was Sita's son, the male tiger at that time. And Art comes in, you know, I knew he's going to be somewhere there in a different Jeep. 
and we path, we cross paths. And I yell at like, Art, is that you? And his Jeep stops and we reverse and we say hi, hello. And he was there probably for a day or so. And we mm. were there for three days. And we were disappointed. It was the last day. We had not seen any tigers and Art had seen Bamera, the male main tiger. So I was quite jealous of Art. I did not like him then at that time. <laughs> I don't blame you. But she was my, uh, the elephant driver. We went in at six o'clock in the morning, which is when the gates open and we'd go out as far as we could. And I had an incredible guide there. His father, his great grandfather was actually the Maharaja of Bandavgar. He was his private hunting preserve, which then became a national park. And so I was with a grandson who knew everybody and he was still revered as a prince. And um, so and he was educated in America. His name is Drew. Is that Amit? Is that Amit? No, Drew. Oh, I know Drew as well. Yeah, yeah. but uh, we stayed at the what was once the palace, and it was pretty dilapidated. But we stayed in these uh, army tents. It was incredibly hot, like it was in April, 125 degrees in the daytime. And but anyway, that we were going down the road, and the elephant Mahout flagged us over and he said, quickly get on the back of the elephant, come with me. And so we rode up the mountain and here was Sita's 18 month old uh, female uh, uh, cub. And she was laying on this rock, but there was no sun on her. And I said, oh, wow, that's too bad because it's like, a, she was incredible, perfect position. And um, I asked if we could just wait, you know, cause the sun was, I could see the sun coming across this, the mountain in the distance. And I thought I could realize, I realized if the sun just gets over the, over the hill, it would possibly strike her. And it did. And I was using Fuji 50 film again in a 300 millimeter 2.8 Nikon lens. And it was a 15th of a second and a 30th of a second at 2.8 on hand holding on the back of elephant, which is a bit challenging. But I shot one roll of film and about 80% of them were were out of, not out of focus, but the movement was too much. And then this one or two words like this. And as soon as the light, uh, sort of two minutes later, after the light was hitting her, she just got up, she gave a big stretch and she just walked off into the, into the jungle and disappeared. But you can see on her, on her paws there that she had feasted on something. There's some blood on her, on her paws, but uh, it was, it's my favorite. I think my very favorite cat image. Nice, beautiful. beautiful, very beautiful. I love the pose, just elegance. Let's Thank let Tom move on quickly. We want to see all his images. Okay, so a uh, mountain lion from Jackson Hole. I had uh, never seen a mountain lion before this one, and many people came up to me and in the galleries when I have receptions with them and say, uh, "You know, why don't you have pictures of mountain lions? Because you have pictures of tigers, polar bears, leopards, lions." cheetahs. And I said, well, 99.5% of all mountain lion pictures are either chased by dogs or hunters um, and then taken, you know, before they're shot or they're from game farms, which are rent cats and posed for photographers or filmmakers or artists. And they kept in cages for 365 days a year beyond being taken out for photo models. And I said, I'm not interested in keeping animals in cages and and I think it's immoral and unethical and beyond that it's a lie to the viewer and so uh, 1999 I learned from my assistant whose husband worked on the refuge that this cat was in at the National Elk Refuge in the called Miller Butte and so I spent um, and there had been one there before and I spent um, 42 days watching this just to get this one, pretty much this one picture. It was shot with an 80, 800 millimeter lens, Nikon lens, the 2X and a 1.4 extender. So it's like looking through a Coke bottle at one eighth of a second with a tripod and a monopod and a bean bag. And I did a little book called Spare the Rockies, all this. And I learned um, that if she left the den, uh, there was hunting just beyond the refuge a half a mile and she could be killed. Um, and that her kittens would not survive because she, they're dependent on her for nursing. So she, um, because of that, I realized that I needed to do something. And so I co-founded the Cougar Fund, which 
uh, anybody interested in helping support that, you can go to cougarfund.org. Very nice. This is the image you were talking about, Art. Right. That's right. Beautiful. It's very nice. Again, the white background, and I, I, it's not no Photoshop, nothing. This is in Serengeti in uh, Serenera, and I saw many leopards there. She had a kitten behind her, behind the a tree. There's a sausage tree, and everybody thinks it's Photoshop because of the white background. It was much like what we just did with the the kestrels. The uh, skies in Africa, you know, are hot, and and uh, it's about ten o'clock in the morning. And it's a beautiful tree and all that negative space. And just, I love the to the all the repeating patterns. You can figure them out. But I love looking at this image. And the, the tail is, uh, um, you know, in the tail, uh, repeated patterns and ears, etc. But I named it Shades of Sapphire because the color of the lichen and that. But I, I yeah, took a the lichen uh, make it, makes it so beautiful to me. Thank I mean, you. The cat has great positioning, but boy, that lichen. And the texture of the tree just co uh, complements the cat Thank so you. nicely. But I metered the, the cat with a spot meter, a handheld Pentax spot meter, and I didn't care about the background, but because the exposure was so different on film, like five stops overexposed, and so the background just went white, which was a gift. Yeah. Mountain Mount Gorilla in Rwanda, Runga Park. First time I went there, I realized I was too excited about seeing gorillas. And I had, I got, you know, I just sort of scattered shot. You only have one hour a day with the gorillas uh, there because of the disturbance of humans and stuff. And, and so um, I went back, I was with my friend Howard Buffett, who was helping support the Gorilla Foundation there. And, and he invited me to come back again. And I realized I had not gotten a good picture of a silverback. So my second trip, I just said, I'm going to spend my whole time just photographing silverbacks. And so I saw these two silverbacks in the lying down, sleeping. And I thought, I'm just going to sit up here. And 45 minutes went along. And I realized that they're going to sleep through this. I'm not going to get a picture of any gorilla, let alone the silverback. In about minute 50 or so, this one sat up and just stared at me. And I clicked the shutter and... Uh, is a 300 millimeter 28 and that image is one of those that kind of if we look at primates like gorillas as you well know art and paramol is like uh they're so like us chimpanzees like jane obviously has taught us uh you know we're so close in uh, genetically and otherwise that these kind of things changes and moments change at least change my life it's a beautiful image. Thank you. This is in my more or less backyard, 20 miles north of here. My favorite place is the Oxbow Bend in Teton Park. And I've been leading a photo trip um, that morning. And I, um, it was an incredible color. We don't get colors like the Northeast and other places, hardwood forest, but the aspens can be brilliant or they can be really dull because they freeze. But the, the, the uh, class of about 15 people, they, they, we were all going to go to breakfast about 10 o'clock. And then I saw that the lake had gone totally smooth and the aspens were more brilliant than I'd ever seen them. And so I asked them if they wanted to stay and they were smelling bacon and eggs and they left. And, <laughs> and so I put my camera equipment away and, and, uh, and then they left. I thought, you know, I'm just going to sit here and enjoy the scene. And I went down to the shore of the Oxbow and set up my panoramic camera and just to see what would happen and enjoy the morning and took my coffee. And at noon, I fell asleep and I heard this rush of wings overhead. And I looked up and I saw this, this eagle chasing an osprey. And I reached for my 70 to 200 millimeter lens. And I realized it was still in my car because I had taken it back and I was so upset with myself. So then I tried to, you know, shoot with a 617 panoramic, which is foolish and not doable. So I put it back on the tripod and I just thought, well, maybe the eagle will go in front of the Teton. Just, I never ever and before that or today seen an eagle quite like this in front of the Tetons, although I mean in that area, although there are eagles there, but the, anyway, the Osprey dropped the fish, which is nobody can, you can't see it in this, but it dropped the fish and the eagle 
turned around and he banked with his wings and he looked over his shoulder to go back and get the fish. But the fish had sunk because the osprey had probably punctured the air bladder in the fish. And so the parable is, you know, don't be selfish because neither one of them got the fish. <laughs> uh, British Columbia, uh, Great Barrier Rainforest, I, I went there to um, support the Wild Ground uh, Bear Foundation who supports uh, habitat um, for bear habitat where they um, purchase or get conservation easements um, where bears used to be, mostly grizzly bears. And um, we went um, to the, this area and puttered around. And I said to my driver, guide, um, boatman, Jamie, we just a little fishing boat. I said, you know, I saw this scene like six days before. And I said, if you could put a black bear on that rock, it would be great, Jamie. And he laughed and because I saw this as, you know, it's a beautiful without the bear. And so there was no bear and we went on and six days later, we were ready to, we, the plane was coming in, the float plane was coming in to pick us up and nobody wanted to go out because it was too crappy and rainy. And I said, well, we only have four or five more hours. Let's just go and putter around. So we puttered around this rock and here was this black bear uh, down in the kelp, the yellow kelp there eating uh, mussels. And so we just shut off the engine, drifted up to it. And the bear went around the right side uh, and, and behind the island. And so I said, let's go around the other side and maybe the bear will go up on the, on the top. We went around the other side and he'd already gone over the top back to this side. So <laughs> we came back to where we should have stayed. And here the bear was walking up, up on the rock there. So I shot both a, a, my first digital camera, Nikon D1, I think it was and uh, my film camera, probably a F4 or something. And um, I shot them both very quickly and it was 15th of a second with the film camera and maybe a 30th of a second with the digital camera. And this is the first digital image I ever made because it was sharp and it had, a, it was motion. It wasn't because it was sharper than the film, but because it had stopped the motion of the rocking boat and stuff. If you look closely, you can't see this, but if you look closely, there's a, right below the bear, there's an anchor and a cable. And I thought, when I saw this, I thought, crap, hand of man in this beautiful setting, great bear rainforest. I thought, oh God, dang it. And so when I got home, my assistant, Annie said, well, I can just take that out digitally, you know? And I said, no, we don't do that. It's there. And then I realized that that cable was for uh, anchoring um, logging barges. And if you look to the right of this, this looks like a very pristine, but to the right of this is a devastated um, clear cut rainforest. They only left about 50 yards of ancient trees and the rest was looked like it was nuked by, well, nuked by bombs. And I realized that this old cable, rusty cable with the anchor and rock was part of uh, well, it, it anchored the barges and they slid the logs down and onto the barges and they went to took the logs to probably China or someplace to, you know, make a particle board that they sold back to us. But so I had a hard time naming this image, but we call it Guardian of Night Inlet because mm -hmm. sort of like that. So it has a lot of meanings, but I'm glad it, you know, um, actually the hand of man in this case uh, works. Mm. Great story. Uh, it's Lamar, Lamar, Lamar Valley. Um, again, very cold, 25 below zero in January. Um, this is the Druid pack, which was the first pack of wolves that was introduced into Yellowstone in the um, early years, uh, the 20 years, 25 years ago now. Um, and there were 15 wolves this year. And uh, Sue, my assistant, and I, we were there for a week or so when he saw this pack of wolves um, patrolling their territory, looking for game and, and elk. And, and that e evening before, and I, I saw these frosted trees full of hoarfrost. And the next morning, we went out early and went, we found the wolves coming back down Lamar Creek and Soda Creek. And, and the sun had just come over the top of the mountain 
and lit up these trees and the line of wolves. We went ahead about a mile and just waited for them, hoping that they would follow the creek bed. And sure enough, they did. And so sometimes you get this incredible contrast of the blue light with yeah. the shadow and the wolves all on the line. There was actually like 15 in there, but I, if I had pulled back, made them wider, they'd be quite small. So I oh. elected just to do uh, eight or 10 or whatever it is there. It's beautiful. beautiful. Thank you. Uh, this is the cover of my book, uh, Last Great Wild Places. And again, Sue and I had gone up there many mornings and for many years, I tried to get elk crossing um, the Snake River uh, in front of the Tetons, in front of Mount Moran here. And for about three weeks in a row, we went there and um, we uh, were hoping to find elk at daybreak as they go to the right side, which is the Elk Meadows, Willow Flats area. Uh, to graze and then in the early morning they go back across the river to the left side into the deep forest to basically hide for the day because hunting season starts there's a hunting season at Teton Park for elk which is crazy in my opinion and unfortunate because it's not needed and it's it's a national park and we shouldn't be killing elk in a national park and it's a reduction they call it but it's not you know if you want to reduce them there's other ways of doing that like stop feeding them in the elk refuge and let them, you know, balance themselves. But anyhow, uh, the elk are, are afraid to be out in the, in the uh, light, like Yellowstone where you can go there and they're sleeping on porches like in Gardner and things. And they're totally calm and tame, I guess, or tame is not the right word. But anyway, the elk go to the right to feed at night and they go back in the morning to hide out in the signal mountain area. One morning we went up there and looked for the elk and we saw this bear pulling an elk out of the right in the middle there on the island, pulling an elk out of the river. And he had obviously or she uh, had ambushed the elk probably crossing the river and they were swimming, drug it out and then spent five days on the left side where the grass is and the yellow grass feeding on it. And the fifth day I went up there and not expecting, cause it, it um, protected the, its carcass, her carcass from magpies and ravens and coyotes and eagles and everything else vigilantly. And I went, walked around along thinking that it would be over there in the dark. And I was with a buddy and, and he told me that he said, Tom, right behind you, there's a bear. And about 15 feet away was this bear, which is one that I've, very familiar with 399, which I've spent now 15 years documenting. And, and she's very calm and she probably knows my scent. She was, she went up on the top of the ridge on the right side, stood up in front of Mount Moran and I had my 70 to 200 millimeter uh, Nikon lens and it came down and then it went into the river and I turned around and walked on the um, rock, um, edge there to get it the mountain in the in the background in the right in the snake in the winding river and uh, this is the kind of image that's my favorite getting the getting an animal small in its habitat and it's very serendipitous because we went there to photograph elk not bears it's certainly not 399 and that as you know art and paramount that light on the on the top of the mountain like that is lasts for all of about two minutes yeah, and the pink light is gone. So uh, that's what we call serendipity. And if you spend enough time out there, uh, you get those kinds of opportunities. It's amazing. amazing. Um, the best time to photograph of bears probably is obviously in the spring. Yellowstone called Mountain Outlaw. There were five bears uh, every year. Uh, bison cross the Yellowstone River. They fall through the ice. And they drown. I can't figure out why bison continue to do that year after year. I heard that, but I think actually what, then I heard that road kills and bison and things are thrown off the the bridge at um, the fishing bridge and they float down to the Lee Hardy Rapids, which makes more sense. And they get caught up in the rapids and the bears, which makes sense. You throw the you know throw them, you know so they could be food for the bears. And in the spring when they emerge, the bears find these carcasses. And there are five bears on this carcass. 
And uh, they were, you know, take, taking their turns and squabbling and fighting. And then one bear left the car and swam across the river towards where we were parked along the highway in a little pullout. And uh, it went behind my car and sort of out of sight. And then pretty soon uh, more squabbling and roaring and everything. And this bear uh, exited the forest and he was a bit scarred up. If you look closely at below his eyes, there's some red bloody marks there. And he was walking right towards me. I had a 600 millimeter with a 2X extender. And I was just standing next to my door. And I realized that he was getting closer and closer. But that's you know, 1,200 millimeters. He was still plenty far. But I had to turn it you know, vertically to get him in there. And then I just left my tripod and the lens and uh, outside. And he was interested. He wasn't looking for me. He was looking for the female because she was. then I realized she was an estrus. And he just walked around the back of the car. And then he courted with her. And she slapped him around. And, after about an hour, uh, she made it with him and they made it maybe uh, three or four times in the next hour and a half. And then he came down right by the car, about 20 yards away. And he just laid down and he smoked a cigarette. <laughs> uh, Denali National Park. I know we, we saw each other there years ago, Art. And um, you know it well. We've been there 20 times. You've probably been there that many times at least. Uh, Early September, um, fall colors, the dwarf birch is a red, willows are the yellow, and obviously Mount McKinley, now called Denali, more properly. And there's this bull moose with this harem of only three cows, uh, and it was down below that ridge line, about 300 yards, and I went down there right at daybreak, and I saw the moose and I realized I was with my friend Chip Hausman and his girlfriend. And um, I saw the moose heading towards the, this little ridge. And I told Chip, I said, we should go there and get on the other side of the pond just in case they come along this ridge, which would be one in probably a million. And, but that's what we do. You have to dream. You have to wish. You have to want. You have to be passionate. And I know that's, what, again, what you do, Art. But so we just was getting set up. Again, the panoramic camera, the Fuji 617 is eight frames, a roll film. It's, it's terribly, it's all manual focus and, and everything. And it's very difficult, but it, the moose came up. Sure enough, and before I got things focused, it laid down right where it is now. And I was so upset as was Chip was working on a film and it's, it was just, oh my God, we were so close, like two seconds, that's all we needed. And I told Chip, I said, well, you know, the, you know, the, the pond was, had, um, it wasn't calm like this. So I said, well, it wasn't that great anyway, it was good. But, so I said, it'll get up in three hours because that's about how long they sleep and then they go feed, and especially this time of year. And following the females, and sure enough, three hours later, the, the pond went dead calm, which is rare in Denali, as you know, Art, <laughs> in the fall, because usually the wind comes up with all the snows and things. And the three female cows started walking off and the big bull stood up and I shot like four frames. And uh, again, serendipity, but the more you know about animal behavior, of course, and the more you you dream and, and the more you're out. It's about time and patience and and but you know i could have easily walked away and been upset but then i thought okay well once you know it's going to get up i know it, it's not going to sleep more than two or three hours so um patience, patience. it's beautiful oh so, <laughs> changing can i guess the name of this yeah yeah it's called this changing lanes changing lanes yeah you tell me about it parallel you know about it Mongoro creator and they, and there's a there's there's between us there's one person who actually has a print of this that's me um in fact it's hanging in my kitchen and i love just counting the lines every time i pass by it my son loves this image too i just love this image and you i think you told me that you didn't have any pictures of uh, photographs of art at all is that true parallel that is true i don't yet have a print of art in fact when he came over for uh, Dinner to my place, I had to hide that image just to not upset. <laughs> 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 
That's great. I'm fired That's up over time, but uh, just just real quick on this one. Actually, I had you sign this the back side of the print when I when I got this from you. This was again the same time as the book, and I remember the uh, gallery person saying. Are you sure you want to like sign it? Because it said not just sign. It said dear Parimal and a message, and it's uh, because you can't sell it after that. If you want to resell it down the line, I said I don't want to sell it. It's for me. <laughs> Thank you. Nice story. Great story. So we were we were staying in in Gorongoro Crater is one of my favorite places in Africa. It's, it's like the Eden of Africa. It has all the all the prey and all the predators of the rest of the Serengeti, and is quite small. The volcanic crater in I mean, it's 30 miles in each direction i think and uh we were camped up uh, three or four miles up the hill and um we came down early in the morning and i saw these this pride of lions which has uh, various uh, age groups of cubs and uh they were coming out of the grass on the right there was a marsh down there just waking up and i, I asked the driver to hurry quickly because i didn't want to want them to get on the road. I mean, I didn't want them to be on the road when I take a picture of them. I want to take them in the natural habitat in the grass. And, you know, there's no way we could get between where we were and there uh, in time. And so they started walking down the road right towards us. So I asked the driver, just stop, stop. And I poked my head out of the top of the Land Rover. And I thought, well, this is kind of cool. It's, you know, it's walking on the road towards us. And, and uh, changing lanes has became the uh, title and uh, it's probably one of my more popular images, but sometimes, again, things that you wish for, you don't get, and, and it still works out. It's a beautiful image. I'm glad you have it. <laughs> Polar dance, uh, again, my years, uh, 10 years in uh, Churchill, Hudson Bay, uh, whiteout snowstorm raged for several days, and we were with Oh, six or eight other colleagues, photographers, and I was with Fred Brumer, who is the uh, one of my most favorite people on earth. He um, yeah, very he, gentle, so yeah, poet, artist, photographer, uh, writer, spoke seven languages, and spent most of his life studying Arctic peoples in the fifties and seventies, um, and pretty much recorded their last, you know, true, true uh, ways. Anyway, I got to meet him. I read his book, Arctic World, when I was in college, and and I always wanted to meet him. Unfortunately, I did, and we became great friends. But we uh, we would have our own buggy up there, and Tender Buggy and Churchill, and nobody else wanted to go out because it was they, you couldn't really see much. And Fred was, you know, oh my God, he spent winters and in the Arctic from Greenland to Siberia. So, you know, none this, you know, bad weather was no big deal. So we found these two big male polar bears play fighting and they were, they lay down in the snow and, you know, when they got overheated and they started, started this dance, it's just, they, they do this to keep in shape probably, but I think it's actually for fun. Uh, again, anthropomorphism is you can't say that these bears, they weren't, weren't angry at each other, they just, uh, I think I really think they were enjoying doing what they were doing. Yeah. Like like dogs playing, you know. So yeah. But the step and the gesture, it's all about gesture. So much of it's about gesture and and your human canvas art is so you're like the master of gesture, human gesture and and animal gesture. But um so we named it Polar Dance and uh we went back to camp and and the guys there were saying, you know, what do you see? And we saw, oh, we saw a couple of polar bears play fighting. And Fred just looked at me like it was one of the most magnificent, you know, hours we spent uh, mm -hmm. together. And um, so, you, you know, that, that makes me... <laughs> pardon? It's such a striking image. Again, the atmospheric conditions, the, the gesture, the body posture, all of that just come together in such a beautiful way. Thank you. So I think that's the end of the. Wow. Just leave it. Wow. Up. Great, great, great stories and photos. Thank you so wow. much, Art. Thank you, you so know. much. And I, as we wrap this up, I had a couple of questions for uh, for for you. Um, 
One I'm going to ask both of you. Uh, I know we're a little lower, but this is mesmerizing. Really, I love the stories. That the audience is loving the stories. They're following along. And even though we have gone over, nobody has left. That shows that they enjoyed the conversation. So uh, one question I want to actually ask to you both, starting with you, Tom. What's the one quality you like in art, and art vice versa about Tom, that you wish you had? I wish I had his sense of... Uh design and um, he's, a, he's the best, he, he has the best sense of design. I don't know if that's the right word, but organization, abstract. I mean, in, in so much, he's done so much with, you know, like the human uh, book he did, plus close-ups, plus he sees so well. I don't think anybody sees photographically better than art. And that's just true. And, uh, I wish I had that sense of, of um, seeing as well as art does in design wise. Yeah. Oh, if you were in my room right now, I'd kiss you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd let you. Okay. <laughs> you would let me. Okay. You know, for me, Paramal, um, I think Tom embodies uh, realness in his work, but in who he is. He's a, a blatantly honest human being and it underlies the work that he does. And you can just see in his presentation of his favorite images that he doesn't alter the images at all. He, it, those photos are as he sees them and shoots them and wills them. I mean, I, in many of these cases, he's willing the animal into the location and it worked. And so I, I love the, his blatant honesty. He's a great champion for the environment and for the wild creatures. And it's, uh, it's obvious that he's become close friends with Jane Goodall, who also sees those same qualities in the human that he is. Thank Wonderful. you. I want to kiss you too now. Okay, well, we'll <laughs> wait. We'll have to do that. <laughs> so let's end with Let's end with a question for you, Tom. Uh, there are a lot of wildlife and nature photographers out there, you know, who want to make a career and it's a, it's a demanding field. It's not an easy field by any means. And you have obviously accomplished so much. What is the one message or inspiration you would give to all the aspiring photographers out there? Well, I think what we've just discussed and what, you, you know, with art and, you know, I have always been more taken to artists in a way, like Andrew Wyeth and Robert Bateman and Owen Grammy and in, in old masters, uh, and old master photographers who Ansel Adams and Edward Weston, and to study all those kinds of different art forms and sculptures, as far as that goes, bronzes, uh, but learn as much as you one can about an animal. It doesn't have to be, it can be in your backyard. You don't have to go to Africa. Africa has been done so much by so many people, including Art and myself and hundreds of others, thousands of others, but find something you're passionate about. You have to be passionate about something to make it really effective. Uh, today I've been out, I was in Nebraska for six weeks which I go to my cabin there where I grew up every year since I was born. I missed one year when I was in Africa in March to see the crane migration. And I'm still inspired by the crane migration. Jane Goodall has been out there 18 years because she's inspired by, she's rejuvenated by seeing cranes as ancient birds and what they stand for, longevity and peace and love and all this stuff. But uh, so I get refueled by being outdoors. I get refueled by places like in Nebraska. I've been working on this book about this particular bear that you saw in the crossing the river, 399. She's 25 years old now. She had quadrup quadruplets last year. And she's at 25. That's a pretty old age to have quads. And there's only like 2% of bears in the all of Yellowstone that's ever had quads. And I remain in enthusiastic by her. And I'm documenting her life. I did a book called Grizzlies of Pilgrim Creek and working on another one now. And and a film. Uh, so I get hooked on 
on things I'm passionate about, cranes. I did two films about cranes, one Hooping Cranes for Geographic, one on Sando Cranes for BBC Nature and and PBS Nature. And uh, in another 10 years on polar bears, and now like 15 years, I'm not talking about three or four months a year. I spent 150 days during COVID last year, basically photographing, looking for, looking for 399. And out of those days, it's 20 out of 150. So wow. uh, that takes a lot of, of passion and patience and drive. And I think if people have that about whatever it might be, frogs or something, worms or, you know, plants or trees or wild landscapes, or, but you have to have that or you won't, don't bother. Um, you can't go from uh, A to Z by going to game farms or by, you know, over manipulating your images in Photoshop. I have so many people say, well, you know, my, a few workshops that I do say, well, they don't take the time to learn their camera, learn depth of field, learn shutter speeds and learn what you can actually do creatively in the camera. They want to do it afterwards and say, well, I'll fix this. I'll make it work and you know, when to get home. And I think that's bullshit. You know, you do it in the camera and, you know, you use your feet as a, you know, a change of perspective. And so you have to have the passion, you have to learn, you have to be patient and the drive. And if you don't have those, then don't go to this profession because it's very difficult these days. Uh, it was difficult when Art and I started, but now everybody, we had to learn the technology of our cameras and I'm, the, I'm a technically challenged for sure, but I know F-stops, Shutterspeeds, and I know enough to get around the camera, but half the crap on my camera, I have no idea what it's for. But it's a small field, but if you're creative and you learn and you work hard, you can you can make it, but you have to realize it takes, it takes an extra huge amount of effort. I've been out now since I came back from Nebraska. I miss 399 coming out of the den because last year she came out May 15th with four four cups. This year she came out on April 15th with her four cups, a month earlier. So I missed her by a day because I had it all packed up and I was I was photographing prairie chickens in Nebraska because I love the way they dance. So I, I blew it, but I've seen her only twice now in 20 days. But today, I, today I saw her her daughter, who's five years old, with her first cub who came out of the den probably wow. yesterday. So now she is her second daughter, who's had cubs. So we're celebrating uh, her daughter, and so so she said eight, this will be eighteen uh, offspring in her lifetime, and um, about half of those have been lost because mostly human hunters or poachers or whatever but anyway it's been a I, I i think art art and i work differently you help me help me here art i'm sorry to go on but um i've probably been about to ten, a tenth of the number of places that art goes because he's he he is a master at going into a place assessing it and tell me if i'm wrong but he can see again with his eyes that this is what's important and, and do it and his ability to uh, produce so many books in such short period of time is amazing to me. And I, here I am stuck with, you know, well, I've done a lot of things, but I get, I get too obsessed with, with uh, too, too few animals. So I better hurry up and get on with it before I croak. You know, I think Tom, that uh, you're very gracious to me and I really appreciate it, but boy, uh, it's an honor to have you on our show. It's really an honor to have your show. I'm very honored to know you. And, uh, you know, we need to talk about doing something together and raise some money for a charity. But right now, we've got four minutes before my tequila time comes on. Yes. So I'm gonna say, yeah. We better say goodbye to you. <laughs> thank you. I do want to say thank you. Thank you to both of you. Literally, I mean, this has been inspiring and many, many months in the making. I want to thank you, Art, obviously. Thank all the audience and, and Tom. Like this frame, we are all photographers and visual. This frame is to die for. We have two legends in the same frame. That's a personal honor for me. So with that, thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you, Art. And thank you to all of you. I'll be in touch, Tom. I'm, you so I want to say, uh, I'd like to do something with you. 
in, in Jackson and we can put it out for charity or uh, for a, a cause that you want. But it would be nice to spend five days with you with maybe one or two people that would want to pay for that experience. But I'll call you within the next week or so, okay? Sounds great. Thank you so okay. much. Really appreciate Thank it. You. It's an honor to be with both of you. All Thank right. You. Thanks, Tom. You did, did a great job.